morning, everyone. So glad you could join us today here at Calvary Temple's online service. My name is Marcia Mays, and I'm the administrative pastor here at Calvary Temple. Um, I trust that you all have had a wonderful week. Um, here in St. Charles, it's been kind of interesting. Uh, we've had quite a lot of snowfall, and you know, there's just something about looking out um, from inside my warm home, looking out that window and seeing all of that beautiful white, fresh snow, just covering the ground, blanketing everything. I just think it looks so pretty when it first falls. But then you know what happens is a few hours, a few days later, you look out and um, the snow has been trampled. Um, it's melted and refrozen. Cars have driven on the driveway and on the parking lots, on the roads, and uh, it just kind of is dirty and discolored. And you know what, you may be watching this morning and you may feel like that your life is kind of like that um, snow that's a few days, few hours old, that's just kind of dirty and discolored. You may be discouraged today but we want to encourage you today that with Jesus and his love, his help, his touch, that your life can be turned around and it can be fresh again. It can be crisp again. It can be pure again. Um, and so today we, again, we thank you for joining us. And uh, we'd just like to open the service with a word of prayer and a prayer to encourage you and minister to you. So would you pray with me this morning? Father, today we are so thankful that you love us with an everlasting love, that you come into our lives and you take away the hurt and the pain and the parts that are yucky or discolored or dirty. You remove those and you replace that with your love, your peace, your comfort. And so today I pray a special blessing on all who are watching today that you would touch them and that you would minister to them and that you would bring peace into their lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Again, we thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoyed the service today. God bless you.
was a wretch I remember who I was I was lost, I was blind I was running out of time Sin separated The breach was far too wide From the far side of the chasm you had me in your sight so you made a way across the great divide left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside and there at the cross you paid the debt i owed broke my chains freed my soul for the first time I had hope thank you Jesus for the blood applied thank you Jesus it has washed me white thank you Jesus you have saved my darkness into glorious light you took my place laid inside my tomb of sin you were buried for three days but then you walked right out again and now death has no sting and life has no end for I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb thank you Jesus for the blood applied thank you Jesus it has washed me wide
Well, thanks so much for joining us here at Calvary Temple Online. Can you believe that it's February already? Wow, this year is already flying by pretty quickly. Well, grab your Bibles. We're going to look at 1 John chapter 1 today. Uh, as you're going there, it kind of remind me, I came across some memes I thought were, were, were pretty uh, neat. One of them, it says, the sole purpose of a child's middle name is so he knows when he's in trouble. How many of you can relate to that? You know, if you heard your middle name, you knew something was going on. Well, I love this. This is some kids' clothing. And on the tag, it says this, wash inside out, remove child before washing, made in China. Interesting, I mean, that you wouldn't think of removing the child, right? All right. I love this too, this boat, this picture of the boat, unsinkable too. I wonder what happened to the first one. And then speaking of this year already, kind of reminds me of a Charlie Brown comic. You know, I hate this year. Everyone said that it would be better, uh, but, but, they, but they're not, but it's not. I, I don't think this is a new year at all. In fact, I think that we've been stuck with a used year. You know, sometimes we think that way, don't we? Well, today we're beginning a new series on the book of 1 John. It's called Certainties because 1 John is a book of certainties. In fact, the word know, K-N-O-W, appears frequently all throughout its pages. Now, the key idea is that the Christian life is a life of knowing, a life of assurance, a life of, of, of certainties. John states that we can know God. We can know where we stand with God. We can know what God expects of us. We can know God's will. We can know that our prayers will be heard, that they're being heard by God. And he describes it this way, that the Christian life is a life of living in the light. And so we're going to spend the next five weeks exploring exactly what it means to live in the light. Today we begin with chapter one as, as, as John talks about that very thing, living in the light. Let's look at it, John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We're writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. Or other translations say, so that our joy may be complete or full. Verse 5, this is the message we heard from Jesus and now declared to you. God is light. There is no darkness in him at all. So we're lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but we go on living in spiritual darkness. We're not practicing the truth. But if we're living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we claim that we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sin to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we're calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for this incredible passage of Scripture that teaches us so much about how we can live in the light, how we can walk with you, but most importantly, how we can receive your forgiveness in our life and walk in that forgiveness. So Lord, speak through this mouthpiece and challenge us today in our lives that we would grow spiritually and more like you and, and, and closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let me ask you, do you remember playing with an Etch-a-Sketch when you were a kid? I mean, you try to sketch out your name or a house or maybe a dinosaur. And then when you mess up the masterpiece, you can just turn it over, shake it real good and hard. And like magic, you start over with a clean slate. Well, John, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 is really the etch-a-sketch verse of Scripture. John said in verse number 9 here, But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. It is a simple, no-nonsense promise that's stated in very plain language for anyone to understand. The condition is that we confess our sins. The promise is that God wipes the slate clean. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? You know, it, it can't be that easy, right? In fact, psychiatrist Carl Menninger actually points out how 
how easy it is. He, he's the author of the book, Whatever Became of Sin. He one time said that if he could convince the patients in psychiatric hospitals that their sins were forgiven, 75% of them could walk out the next day. Forgiveness of sins is so liberating. Listen, when we hear about God's generous attitude toward forgiveness, oftentimes we'll come back with the question, well, I mean, if God guarantees my forgiveness, does that mean that I can commit any sin that I want and that God will forgive me and I can sin as much as I want? You know, it's kind of like that meme I saw one time that said this, how many sins can I commit and still get to heaven? Now, the person that asked that question is, approaching the Christian life from the wrong direction. That person understands very little about what it means to be a Christian. Because the main focus of the Christian life is not about getting your sins forgiven so that you can go to heaven. I mean, that's part of it, but that's not all of it. God has so much more in mind for us. You know, it's kind of like having a job. Everybody that works is entitled to get paid, but no customer and no employer wants to deal with a worker who is only there for the money. Now, we've all known people like that. They don't like their work. They don't like who they work with. They don't like who they work for. They just want a paycheck. And we can agree amongst ourselves that this person isn't on the fast track to advancement, right? I mean, with that attitude, they, they, they won't be effective in their job performance. In fact, can you imagine taking that kind of an attitude into a job interview? I mean, you say to your prospective employer, I don't really care about your product or your goals or your company. I just want to know what is the least amount of work that I can do here and still get paid. And yet, some people think that way about the Christian life. What's the minimum I have to do and what's the maximum I can get away with and still be saved and, and still be a Christian? And although most people would never say it that way, if we were all honest, we catch ourselves thinking that way from time to time. And so today, as we explore 1 John chapter 1, I want to challenge you to think the opposite way. How can I maximize my relationship with God and how can I minimize my sinful behavior? You see, a relationship with God is compared here to living in the light. Now, in other translations, they say walking in the light. Now, as we're going to see in this series, this includes knowing where you stand with God, knowing that you're forgiven, knowing that your prayers are being heard, knowing that you have the power to overcome temptation, knowing that God is with you, and, and on and on and on. This is what happens when you live in the light. And today, we're going to look at how we can begin consistently doing this. Now, there are three areas that we're going to discuss. First of all, to consistently live in the light, you must, number one, face your sin. You have to face your sin. Now, there's an old joke about a children's Sunday school teacher who asked his class, children, what must we do first in order to be forgiven of sin? And one little boy raised his hand and he said, well, first you have to sin. Now, that's true. First, you have to sin. And, and we've already accomplished that step. We've already accomplished that. The Bible says that all of us have fallen short. All of us have sinned. Secondly, though, you have to acknowledge it or you have to face it. The truth is we tend to be better at step one than we are at step two. We often try to deny the existence of our sin. Now, of course, very few people would say, I'm not a sinner. I've never sinned as far as generally speaking, for, for example. But when we talk about specific sins, we start making excuses. I mean, I know I lost my temper, but let me tell you why it wasn't wrong. Because you made me do it. I'm under so much stress at work and I haven't been feeling well and you, you really deserved it. Sound familiar? Listen, when it comes to our specific sins, we have a tendency to try to explain them all away. You know, there, there are all these extenuating circumstances, and so we say, so it's not really a sin. You know, I, I mean, I, I'm just reacting. It's not a sin. I'm making an excuse. But you know, that attitude prevents us from experience, experiencing God's forgiveness. It, it, it's like in his book entitled Blue Like Jazz. Don Miller tells a story of his atheist friend named Laura. Now, she had been struggling with the idea of God for some time, and, and now she was on the verge of believing. Don was trying to persuade her to take that final step. And so he said to her, God is wanting a relationship with you, and that starts by confessing directly to him. He's offering forgiveness. His friend Laura looked at him and said, you're not making this easy, Don. I, I don't exactly believe that I need a God to forgive me of anything. And you know what? Therein lies the problem. This is the obstacle to living in the light or our unwillingness to, to, to face our sinfulness, 
to acknowledge that we're a, that, and face that sinfulness in our life. Don said this to his friend. He said, the entire world is falling apart because nobody will admit that they are wrong. But by asking God to forgive you, you're willing to own your own part of the mess. Listen, this is where living in the light begins. John says in verse number eight here, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. And then he says in verse number 10, if we claim that we've not sinned, we're calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. You see, in one verse, John is talking about sin as in our sinful nature. In the other verse, he's talking about sin as in our sinful behavior. And we must face up to both. Now, do you know what facing up is called? Confession. Confession. Confession is pivotal to living in the light. John says in verse number nine, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all wickedness. Confession is facing up to your sin and admitting it to God. Confession means to acknowledge or to accept or agree. Now, the word homoleogio is it, it literally, which is the word confession, it literally means to say the same thing. Confession is saying the same thing about your behavior that God says about it. Confession means that you stop deluding yourself, you stop excusing yourself, you stop justifying yourself, and you come clean about who you are. You know, I'm always a little bit intrigued by corporate lawsuits in which a large settlement is being paid to a claimant with a, a stipulation, well, XYZ company admits no wrongdoing. I mean, they're cutting a check for $5 million to settle a dispute, but they say they didn't do anything wrong. I mean, it's kind of rather generous of, it, of them, isn't it? But, but it doesn't really make any sense. You know, many times we do the same thing. We say to God, you know, I'll pray certain prayers. I'll sing certain songs. I'll show up on Sunday and try to be good. But there is no way that you are going to get me to admit that, that, that I'm not just a little bit better than everybody else. There's no way that you're going to get me to admit that my wife is not responsible for most of my problems. There's no way that you're going to get me to admit that maybe I shortchanged my boss. And on and on and on we go. And that attitude, you know, I'll pay the fine, but I won't admit to have done anything wrong. That keeps us outside of a dynamic relationship with God. So if you want to live in the light, you got to take a long, hard look at yourself and see yourself as God sees you. And then you face up to who you are and, and to what you've done. You confess it to him. And you know what happens next? Number two, you can trust God to cleanse you, to cleanse you. Look at verse nine again. But if we confess our sin to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. And who deserves forgiveness? Certainly not you, certainly not me. But here's the good news. Forgiveness is never given on the basis of who deserves it. It's given on the basis of God's faithfulness. You can't earn God's forgiveness. You can only receive it. Now, Christians who grasp this fundamental biblical truth begin to experience the transforming power of God's presence in their life. And once you get past trying to earn what Jesus is willing to give, we experience freedom in our life. Many Christians doubt that they've been forgiven because they're not sure that they did a good enough job repenting. I mean, did I really convince God that I was sorry? Did I cry loud enough? Did I feel you know, guilty bad enough? Did I confess earnestly enough? I mean, did I earn God's forgiveness? I can assure you that you didn't. You didn't feel, feel guilty enough. You, you didn't cry enough. You didn't confess earnestly enough. You don't deserve God's forgiveness. But you can have it because he is faithful and just. And he said, I will forgive you. And that's all the guarantee you need. Because as Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 4 says, he is the rock. His deeds are perfect. Everything he does is just and fair. He is a faithful God who does no wrong. How just and upright he is. Or Romans chapter 3 verse 26, for he was looking ahead and included them in what he was, would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness for he himself is fair and just and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Can we boast then that, you know, that we've done anything to be accepted by God? 
No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It's based on faith. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18 says that it is impossible for God to lie. He said he will forgive you, and that means he will forgive you. He makes it very plain. He will forgive you of all unrighteousness, of all sin, all wickedness, every sin that you have ever committed, every sin that you ever will commit. God's mercy can cover. It says Edwin Lutz, Lutzer said, he said, there is more grace in God's heart than there is sin in your past or your future for that matter. John says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, he himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. The sins of the whole world. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, it was enough. It was enough to pay for your salvation, for your full forgiveness as well. You don't have to earn it. There's no copay option. You can only receive it. And this is where people oftentimes will stumble. I mean, if forgiveness is given freely and all I have to do is ask, then what's preventing me from sinning as much as I want? Well, first of all, the, the consequences of your sin should be enough to prevent you from doing it. If you're still entertaining the idea that sin is fun, then you don't know the rest of the story yet. What seems at first in sin to be an indulgent pleasure becomes ultimately an inescapable prison. Ask somebody that has sinned without restraint how it worked for them. I'm not just talking about sex and beer and drugs and the party lifestyle. You take a look at those who thought they could get away maybe with gossip without restraint and see the price they paid for it. Take a look at those who thought that they could indulge their temper and see what consequences they faced. That's why the Bible says the wages of sin is death because sin indulged only brings about destruction. But you know, there's a second deeper reason why we don't indulge in sin. And it's because fellowship with God is dependent upon our living in the light or our walking in obedience to him. Living in the light, I'm talking about in close connection to God, is such a great experience that the so-called pleasures of sin pales in comparison. Sin just isn't worth the price that you have to pay for it. Let's say a person loves to gossip. He loves to talk about people. He gets certain pleasure when he hears something bad about someone, and he gets an even greater pleasure when he has a chance to pass that news on to somebody else. Now, this is sin. The Bible makes it very clear that gossip is a sin. It's on the same level, in fact, as fornication and murder. But it's a sin many people think that they can indulge in. And so day after day, this guy, who, who, who's quite pleased with himself spiritually, he looks for bad things to say about others. And day after day, he takes secret pleasure in the misfortunes of others. And day after day, little by little, the light fades from his existence. He loses the joy of fellowship with Jesus. He loses the joy of fellowship with others. People don't trust him. They don't like him. He breaks hearts and even ruins the lives with his careless words. And his prayers are powerless. He doesn't get answers. He lacks the wisdom to make good decisions. And he becomes jaded and bitter because he sees Christianity working for others, but it doesn't seem to be working for him. And so he spends his days running his mouth and stumbling around in the dark. Now, if he asks for forgiveness, will God forgive him? Absolutely. But what if he goes out and gossips again the very next day? Will God forgive him if he asks for forgiveness again? Absolutely. But what if he does it again and again and again? Will God still forgive him? Absolutely. But isn't he getting away with something? Hey, take a look at his life. He's not getting away with a thing. He is miserable. He is accomplishing nothing with his life that's not beating the system, folks. That's getting beat. And, and by the way, for those of you who, who maybe would say, well, if he's really sincere in his confession, he won't gossip again. Hmm. Is that how it works for you? You know, you confess your sin once sincerely to God and, and you never do it again? Because if so, you should be getting pretty close to perfect now. But you're not, are you? You know, even when we're sincere in our confession, we sometimes fall back into the same destructive behavior. But God is faithful and just to forgive us according to his word. 
Now, this guy is miserable, but compare his existence to another person whose sole desire is to live in the light of God's truth. Now, she struggles with sin from time to time, and it breaks her heart. You know, she wants to get rid of the sin in her life because she understands that sin can only destroy. It destroys her fellowship with God and it destroys her relationship to people. And so for her, sin is not a question of, you know, can I get away with this because God will forgive me? It's a matter of, I don't want anything to do with it because I want to become closer to God. Her life is spent in the light. She has a good relationship with Christian friends. She has a dynamic devotional life. She sees her prayers answered on a consistent basis. She receives direction from God and and, and the wisdom to make important decisions. She is accomplishing something with her life. She lives in the light. Do you see the difference? This is what God wants for us. His whole purpose in fixing the sin problem was not so that we could beat the system, but so that we could live in friendship and fellowship with him. God will forgive you as many times as you need to be forgiven because his ultimate goal is that you become so at home in the the light of his love that sin loses its appeal to you. Now, immediately after John wrote about God's blanket forgiveness, he says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, he says, my dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. That's the goal. But then he keeps going and he says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. And not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. You see, the truth about forgiveness is that God forgives you totally, completely, without reservation. And that's a certainty that we need to accept and to act upon. His goal is that you learn to live in the light, to become like him in the process. But there's a third principle that I want you to notice here. And that is number three, forgiveness brings people together. C.S. Lewis said this, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Look at verse number seven. But if we're living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. John says that living in the light goes hand in hand with fellowship and forgiveness. Now there's a stereotype that I've seen over the years uh, of that you know sanctimonious person that thinks that because he's right with God, he's better than everyone else. But guess what? That person doesn't exist, not really. Now I've known religious people who think that they're better than everyone else, but I can assure you they're not right with God. They're not living in the light. They are, in John's words, deceiving themselves and making God out to be a liar. And they are stumbling in the darkness because the Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one, that we've all sinned, every one of us. Let me give you an example of this. In his book, No Wonder They Call Him Savior, Max Licato shares this story. Longing to leave her poor Brazilian neighborhood, Christina wanted to see the world. Discontented with a home, having only a pallet on the floor, a wash basin, and a wood-burning stove, she dreamed of a better life in the city. Well, one morning, she slipped away, breaking her mother's heart. Well, knowing what life on the streets would be like for her young, attractive daughter, Maria hurried, packed to go find her. Well, on her way to the bus stop, she entered a drugstore to get one last thing, pictures. She sat in the photographer's booth, closed the curtain, and spent all that she could on pictures of herself. Well, with her purse full of small black and white photos, she boarded the next bus to Rio de Janeiro. Maria knew that Christina had no way of earning money. She also knew that her daughter was too stubborn to give up. When pride meets hunger, a human will do things that that before were unthinkable. Well, knowing this, Maria began her search. Bars, hotels, nightclubs, any place with a reputation for streetwalkers or prostitutes. She went to them all, and at each place, she left her picture, either taped on the bathroom mirror, tacked to a hotel bulletin board, fastened to a corner phone booth, and on the back of each photo, she wrote a note. Well, it wasn't long before both money and the pictures ran out, and Maria had to go home. Well, the weary mother wept as she 
boarded the bus and began the long journey back to her small village. It was a few weeks later that young Christina descended the hotel stairs. Her young face was tired. Her brown eyes no longer danced with youth, but spoke of pain and fear. Her laughter was broken. Her dreams had become a nightmare. You know, a thousand times over, she'd longed to trade these countless beds for her secure pallet. And yet the little village was in too many ways too far away. Well, as she reached the bottom of the stairs, her eyes noticed a familiar, familiar face. She looked again and there on the lobby mirror was a small picture of her mother. Christina's eyes burned and her, her throat tightened as she walked across the room and removed the small photo. Written on the back was this compelling invitation. Whatever you've done, wherever you, whatever you've become, it doesn't matter. Please come home. And she did. She did. You know, I tell that story because we experience God's forgiveness. And when we do, it affects the way that we look at ourselves and that we look at others. When we realize that our relationship with God is based on mercy, it helps us to treat others in a more merciful manner as well. Forgiveness creates a bond that unites believers because being forgiven helps us to understand that it's all about mercy. It's all about grace. And without God's help, we would, we would be doomed to the darkness. When believers are living in the light, though, they get together. There's an immediate connection. Forgiveness from God brings people together. And so in closing today, the problem of sin has really been solved by the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Not only, though, the sins of your past, but the sins of your future as well. And not only your sins, but also the sins of the whole world. Jesus paid the price for them all. You can be forgiven. God will forgive you as many times as is necessary because his goal for you goes far beyond just merely wiping the slate clean. He wants you to learn to live in the light. He wants you to live in a right relationship with him and in a right relationship with other people. He wants you to experience his power, his wisdom, his presence, his anointing, his fullness. He wants you to walk and to live in the light as he is in the light. And you know, once you become accustomed to living in the light, it's no longer a question of, you know, how much sin can I get away with? It becomes a question of how much sin can I get rid of? And that's because nothing in the world compares with the brilliance of living in the light of God's love living in his light, experiencing his forgiveness. Today, maybe you've never really opened your heart to experience his forgiveness. That, that scripture is for you. That if you'll confess your sin to him, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin. Jesus died on the cross to forgive the sin of all mankind. Today, if you'll open your heart to him and you'll ask him to come into your life and forgive you of your sins, he'll do it. He promises it in his word. So if you've never made that choice, that decision to do that, I want to encourage you just to pray this prayer with me. Say, dear Jesus, I ask you today for your forgiveness for everything that I've done wrong because I know I've messed up. And so Lord, today I, I seek your forgiveness. And your word says that you, you'll forgive me. It's free. It's a free gift from you. So Lord, today come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, hit in the comment section and say, Pastor, I just prayed that prayer because I want to celebrate with you. We want to rejoice that your sins are forgiven and that you are starting a new life with Jesus by your side, living in the light so you can experience the best that God has for you. Today, many of you, maybe you're, you, you, you were, were forgiven in the past when you asked Jesus to forgive you, but you needed a reminder today that God, not just your past sins, but he's concerned about your future sins as well. Today, if we'll just acknowledge that sin, just face it and then confess it to him. He'll begin to not only forgive us and help us to not walk in that sin, but he'll help us to walk in the light. And when we walk in the light, we'll be able to connect with others. So let's close in prayer, asking God to help us to, to not try to sin with abandon, but to sin, to, to, to be free from sin, to get rid of sin. And so Lord, we thank you today for your love and your mercy. We thank you that you have forgiven us and that every time we ask you, forgive us. But Lord, more importantly, we ask you to help us to get rid of sin in our life. 
so that we can walk in the light and that the light of Jesus will shine and it'll draw others to you and we'll have an incredible relationship with others as well. Help us to face the sins in our life and to commit them to you, to give it to you, Lord. And Lord, help us to connect with others, sharing your mercy and showing your light. We give you the praise for it and the glory in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. We look forward to seeing you again next week.